These two new ways of thinking changed history. They were faith and reason. Faith meant all the objective truths that we can know by faith, and reason meant all the objective truths that we can know by reason. What is theology? Theology is the study of God. You're listening to Reason and Theology, where both faith and reason intersect. And welcome to the Reason and Theology show, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, and we are discussing the uh, doctrine of hell, both in Judaism and early Christianity, joined by multiple guests, Craig Trulia, an Eastern Orthodox, Eric Ibarra, a Roman Catholic, William Albrecht, also a Roman Catholic, and then esteemed guest, Dr. Robert Price, who's returning to the show. He's a biblical scholar, apologist, professor, and atheist. Dr. Price, how are you doing? Oh, doing great. I hope everybody else is. Yeah, we're doing well. William, how are you? I'm doing very well. I'm very, uh, very happy to be here again with you guys and with, uh, with uh, Robert Price as well. I'm very excited for a fun show. Absolutely. Eric? Good. Good. I'm doing well. Wisconsin? Yeah, I'm, I got my jacket still on. I didn't even, I didn't even want to take it off. So, I, yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. yeah, it's starting to cool down a little bit over here, too. That's why I have my sweater vest on. Craig, how are you doing over there? How's family life? Oh, family life's great. You can't ask more. I love the baby. Um, there was a following. I just had a new child. Um, but I, you know, I wanted to, because Dr. Price is looking forward to the show because he's back on tonight. And I read this review and I just, I just want to read the snippet mm-hmm. from his new book, Jesus yeah. Christ Superstition. Yeah. Um, and I wish someone wrote something like this about me. This is one of the best books I've ever read and that Dr. Price has ever written, in my opinion, obviously. And that's saying a lot since I've thoroughly enjoyed much of what Price has previously written. And he says, why do I say this? Because this book is straight and to the point, no weighty pedantry. The book is pure and unadulterated, powerful prose. So my first question, I have you, Dr. Price, how much you pay that guy to write that? <laughs> right. are going up. So uh, I... Uh, I don't know if I can do it much longer. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it's awesome stuff. It's awesome to see that. Indeed. Well, let, let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, Dr. Price, let me give you the floor and have you start out and uh, set the pace here. Could you maybe talk to us about your perspective on Hill um, when it concerns Judaism and early Christianity? What are your thoughts on this matter? And we'll just kind of interact with you after you give us your thoughts. Well, the, uh, the historical approach tells me a lot. Uh, the fact that hell is never mentioned in the Old Testament seems uh, a little odd if given the importance of it in the New Testament and Christianity. If this uh, horrifying prospect was the, um, what do they say, the the carrot and the stick, if this stick was available to get people to repent and so on, why hide it from them? I mean, you can imagine somebody who was a Baal worshiper or something uh, winding up uh, suddenly in the hell with his asbestos uh, t-shirt and saying, why didn't I know about this? Uh, it just seems to me it's pretty obvious from that that it's it's likely a, an innovation in belief. And there are fingerprints on it in that we can kind of trace the evolution of it in a, at least in a short, crucial seg- segment of it. Like it appears that the idea of a fiery subterranean hell was um, imported into the Middle East, and I suppose Greek Greece, which originally had. A, a, Hades, but it wasn't necessarily a place of torment, but they have Tartaros, uh, which is a place of uh, torment. It, it, uh, it was all imported seemingly from uh, a bunch of, ne- I don't know if it sounds crazy uh, stuff, but a bunch of Neo-Pythagorean creatures from Sicily who fanned out over the Mediterranean world and spread Pythagorean ideas, but also this notion of a flaming hell of torment. What we do have in the um, the Old Testament that might be considered an anticipation or a foreshadowing of it would be the underground kingdom of Moloch or Molech, depending on what you prefer. Uh, and he was this monster, as you know, 
who uh, received human infants as sacrifices, this was believed to lie at the foot of Mount Zion, which uh, in the ancient world was thought to be the cosmic mountain, the Axis Mundi, just like Greeks had Mount Olympus. These folks thought that the temple atop it was kind of a visible version of the real heavenly temple that Moses saw, etc. And that at the bottom of it, there was the opposite, the kingdom of Molech, uh, where he dined on uh, babies, just like some lunatic suggested at an AOC rally recently. <laughs> and uh, though I think she may either she was a LaRouche Nick, she may have been insane or or just making a spectacle, but who knows? There are some that suggest that well. Uh, from what we know about it, it doesn't seem like they viewed Molech's kingdom of Tophet or uh, the various other synonyms for it as being, oh, and Gehenna also, it, it, they didn't seem to view that as a place of post-mortem torment for the damned or for the wicked. It, the, um, the infants were just sacrificed uh, to him eating them, I guess, symbolically or whatever way they thought sacrifices fed the gods. And of course it's loathsome and that's why it's attacked in Jeremiah and other places, though apparently making a comeback today with, uh, with people uh, expanding abortion into infanticide. It's incredible. Um, but um, it becomes at some point, oh, there's also this old uh, version from, I think, uh, boy, I uh, can't think of it now, but a rabbinic commentator in the late Middle Ages who suggested that Gehenna was a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem where the carcasses of unclean animals and uh, and people who were such sinners, they couldn't get a, a like a church funeral, as we might say. But a, a investi archaeological investigations show there's no evidence of the bones that would have to be there uh, if that's what it was. So apparently that long-standing, attractive interpretation of Gehenna turns out to be mistaken. It, it seems to have just morphed from the underground kingdom of, of Molech uh, on into uh, uh, assimilation to Tartarus and so forth. And then in in the New Testament, it certainly seems to mean that and Jesus refers to the Gehenna of fire, you know, like be radical with yourself if your hand's causing you to sin, chop it off, throw it away, the same with your feet and your eye, because it's better to enter into eternal life maimed than to have it, uh, you know, all spick and span and, uh, and, and be thrown into the flames with it. So there's that. There's also Hades um, references, though I think those tend to have to do with corporate entities like the, oh, you Korads and you Bethsaida, will you be exalted to heaven? Uh, not, not much chance. Uh, you will be uh, carried down to Hades, which all seems to be based on Isaiah um, uh, 14, where they're talking about the king of Babylon winding up in Sheol, to his great surprise. Now, and then in the New Testament, it's it's a mixed bag because uh, in the Pauline writings, no matter who you think wrote them, and the authorship question is open in my mind, there is never a mention of hell or anybody going to hell. The closest thing you come to there is uh, the idea of um, at the second coming, uh, those who persecute the Thessalonians will be destroyed in the, I think it says the flaming fires of judgment. But other than that, as in 1 Corinthians 15, it just seems to picture the um, post-mortem fate of the, the dead and the, the evil, the sinners, as just staying dead. Uh, everyone in his own order, Christ the first fruits of the resurrection, uh, then those who are his, and then comes the end when he hands over the throne to the Father. What happened to uh, the wicked? Now, in Acts, Paul is made to say that there's a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous, uh, and uh, he does have Hades in his gospel, uh, Luke does, but um, then you you have I think in in uh, Matthew there in the famous sheep and goats judgment thing that implies 
a uh, an eternal suffering hell in that it it stipulates that the fire prepared for the devil and his angels are uh, eternal everlasting which would seem pointless if uh, if um, unless you you needed it to keep barbecuing the sinners <clears throat> and um, revelation of course has the uh, the um, resurrection of those who had been be um, uh, beheaded by the beast, they are resurrected to, to rule with Christ during the millennium, whereas it says the rest of the uh, dead didn't come to life for a thousand years. And it does mention an eternal hell of suffering. The smoke of their torment rises day by day, forever and ever. And uh, But who, who are they talking about? Uh, those who took the mark of the beast. We don't really know if the same writer assumed the same would apply to um, to all who were were just you know not not righteous or not believers or whatever. So the uh, the evidence is pretty scanty, it seems to me, and disagrees. And I think that is an inadequate basis on which to make a doctrine of hell if you're a protestant right where everything's got to come right out of the bible i don't think they can really pull that off though they don't care um so that's one thing that undermines confidence in the doctrine's truth to me another worse uh, problem is that if they're if the wicked or even some of them are being consigned to endless torment. This seems to me really impossible to square with the notion of a loving God. And to try is morally dangerous. It reminds me of in the Brothers Karamazov, when uh, Alyosha is trying to get Ivan to come back to the church and he says, I, I can't do it. I'd have to hand back the ticket because I cannot square with a, the idea of a righteous God, the innocent suffering of children. Well, it's even worse with hell. He said, if I have to, to accept that, uh, somehow I, I guess God's justified in doing this, then I become an accomplice after the fact. I say, well, uh, it's okay with me. Uh, and, and you're you're kind of losing your soul in order to save it because that cannot be right. And uh, so I don't see any way of harmonizing those and those who do are inviting moral reproach uh, by uh, closing their eyes to it. So those are a couple of the big things that make me uh, reject the whole notion. Okay. I understand. Um, and, you know, I want to respond to some of that and also um, have mm -hmm. William uh, respond, then Eric, then Craig, actually, then uh, Craig, then Eric. Um, but let me let me actually read something to you that I was reading not too long ago. This comes from a Protestant publication. It's called um, Four Views on Hell. It's put out by the Counterpoint series. And I kind of want to get your thoughts on this when we come back to you, because it's going over the Old Testament. Now, you noted that there's nothing really in the Old Testament that talks about hell. Um, I would first ask, does everything in Revelation uh, that God has revealed have to be in the Old Testament, or can God reveal things progressively and incrementally? And then number two, um, how do we deal with passages like Daniel 12, 2 through 3, which notes... Um, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And I want to read just a brief quote uh, from this book. This is by the contribution made by Denny Burke. He says, the state of those resurrected to life is everlasting or eternal. The Hebrew term translated as everlasting is olam, which often has the connotation of time extending into the distant past and into the future indefinitely. And because the same term describes the duration of both the righteous and the wicked, it's obvious that their destinies are equally extended. So here he's saying the term, the Hebrew term olam, uh, indicates that those who are going to be in everlasting contempt, that this somehow indicates that it's going to be something that happens eternally. So um, maybe if we could deal with the biblical passage there. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that first, or if you want maybe uh, William to, to jump in, give his thoughts, and then you, you respond, and then we'll go to Craig and Eric. Uh, up to you. I would just say, I, I think the, 
notion of progressive revelation is kind of a cop out because it kind of they say God withheld certain things because uh, the people were not ready to hear it. Well, mm -hmm. in that case, there would be no revelation about anything, least of all any notion of salvation <clears throat> by grace, which is supposed to be the greatest offense. So what I can't do it with my good works. Well, nobody would be ready for that until Martin Luther, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the, the idea of uh, withholding so crucial a thing, you're in terrible danger much more than you can even imagine. But we're not telling you about that. Still going to send you to hell, but uh, you won't know about it until you'll be like in the Gary Larson cartoon where these guys' heads are peeking out of baskets carried by demons into the fiery cave. And one of them wakes up and says, uh, uh, where am I? And how did I get in this hand basket? Uh, and uh, is is that the way of it? Uh, gee, I, I could have uh, uh, could have uh, straightened out if I knew what was at stake. Well, too bad you're on candid camera. It just seems to me uh, a lame rationalization. If you need to know anything, wouldn't it be that? Mm -hmm. um, and and with the uh, the everlasting contempt contempt I'm not sure what's envisioned there but uh, the uh, it, contempt doesn't seem to me to be tantamount to eternal torture the mm -hmm. smoke of their torment goes up day and night before the lamb uh, forever mm -hmm. uh, that it seems to me uh, grasping at straws mm -hmm. uh, and oh yeah one other thing I should have mentioned. I agree with Kant that a belief in, in damnation, if you don't do the right thing, forces people into a protracted moral immaturity where everything is, well, I better uh, walk the straight line because I don't want to go to hell. Uh, that, that motivation is so inhibiting. The lowest form of moral consciousness is, my hand's going to get slapped if I go into the cookie jar. And you would only know if anybody really has good motivation and sincere repentance if they weren't facing this as the alternative. So I just think it retards moral growth. It makes God look bad. And it seems to be a late addition to the whole biblical tradition. Okay, fair enough. Uh, that last you... point was really good, by the way. I just want to second uh, William, why don't you go ahead and uh, maybe give us your thoughts? You know, um, Professor Robert Price or Dr. Robert Price was noting that the Old Testament does not have anything that teaches um, hell. He also noted the moral argument that this is not indicative of a loving God. Maybe if you can comment on those things and anything else that you want to throw out. Yeah, uh, first off, I want to start off by saying it, to me, it seems like Bob and myself uh, agree on a few other things as well. Uh, it sounds to me like you're a big fan of Gary Larson, Bob. I'm a huge fan of Gary Larson in the far side. In my opinion, the greatest cartoon to um, have ever run in syndication. Um, how does that tie in with what we're talking about? It ties in very well because Gary Larson loved to do a lot of comic strips um, indicating people being in hell and in, in, turn, in eternal torment, you know, kind of making um, you know funny out of it. But it, to me, it does get to the heart of the issue because – I do disagree with Bob. I think that I think uh, I, Robert Price is an incredible scholar, um, incredible uh, theologian. I think he's a little bit off the target here, though. I think if we look at Daniel 12, too, as you were talking about a little while ago, Michael, and as Robert was talking about, I think we do have a clear vision of we read many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. I, I must confess, I have not really looked at what the Hebrew says in depth. I've looked at the Greek, though, and, and um, I, I'm very well, very well aware of the, the Septuagint uh, textual transmission history, uh, which does uh, predate uh, the Hebrew that exists, it, that is extant, at least. And from what I can tell, maybe Robert will have something else to say, it really does look to me like we're reading about eternal damnation, eternal suffering. Um, it, it really does sound to me because, you know, you've got one group of individuals that are um, arising to uh, eternal life. The word there, uh, I believe, uh, I don't have my uh, Bible open, I'll open in a bit. I think it's Ionios, I believe. Um, so really, really, I do think that it is talking about eternal suffering, 
I think that that is very clear in, in, in the text. I would add to it a little bit that the, the one thing that I do find real interesting, and um, I know Robert is not a huge fan of the early church fathers, but if we look at their testimony, I, th I think their testimony is very important. Um, I think their testimony is very important because a lot of these individuals um, walked the earth and talked to, with the apostles, knew, knew them, uh, a number of them knew John and knew other individuals. So I think that their witness is very important. And the one thing that I find, I find like um, a catena, like Thomas Aquinas called it, like a, a, a golden chain. And this chain goes, it's, it's all connected. And to me, they're all saying the same thing. I've yet, and, and Robert might be able to find a dissenting voice. I've yet to find one. I've looked at, um, uh, I've looked at Hippolytus. I've looked at Lact Lactanius. I've looked at John of Damascus, Irenaeus. I have looked at Methodius. And they all, uh, by the way, a lot of these gentlemen were, were very well learned in Hebrew and the Greek. And they all believe that this is talking about an eternal, you know, suffering that continues and continues. I think that a legitimate argument can be made that the everlasting contempt and the shame here carry, uh, um, carry with it pain, because the Greek word words talk about burden, talk about um, sufferings. So I I know this passage doesn't go into really great detail, you know, talking about eternal hellfire and what have you. But I think the imagery is, I think, strong enough. And I remember we talked, I think, about a month and a half ago or so when we had um, Robert on the last time, which by the way was an incredible show. Um, guys, look that up. Um, whoever's watching right now. One thing that I did bring up was Judith, and as Robert knows very well, because Robert Price um, is very well acquainted with what Catholicism uh, would call the Deuterocanonical books. We believe that these are holy writ as well. Judith does, I believe, talk about uh, a hell. I think Judith is, is very clear when Judith, um, when we read, uh, woe to the nations that rise up against my people. The Lord Almighty will take vengeance on them. Uh, in the day of judgment, he will send fire and worms into their flesh. They shall weep in pain forever. I would be really curious as to how uh, Robert uh, views that text. And I think, I mean, maybe there are a few others, but when I look at um, when I look at Judith and when I look at um, uh, when I look at Daniel, I, I really do think that they're clearly they are clearly talking about uh, hell. I, I I think you made a good point, Michael. I think that may, maybe. Um, Maybe you didn't, well, you didn't go into great detail, but I know exactly what you're trying to say when you say that um, perhaps things become uh, gradually revealed over time. I know you didn't mean that, you know, they're just going to pop up out of the blue that were never believed before. But I know you're talking about the fact that the kernel of truth was there at an early time in history. And I agree with you. I think if we look at um, uh, Judith and we look at Daniel, even Isaiah, I think, I don't even think this is a little kernel of truth. I think this is a, a, you know, a massive amount of truth that we've got. And I think it gets expanded when we come to the book of Revelation, we come to Matthew. And um, really, honestly, I think even if you look at, although I, I can't quote him right now, I think even Josephus goes into depth on some of these, um, some of these uh, notions. I might be wrong there. Robert might, uh, might catch me flat-footed there. But um, those are my thoughts, and I'll move on to somebody else. Yeah, and, I, and I'm glad you bring up the progressive aspect of Revelation there, because I, I would say basically every every Christian tenant you can find at least implicitly in the book of Deuteronomy. I think everything does develop out of that. Uh, so I don't think that you would find anything in the rest of Revelation that would just be entirely new that you can't find in the Pentateuch. But um, Dr. Uh, Price, let me maybe get your quick thoughts on what William said, and then we're going to go to Craig and get your thoughts, and then Eric, and then your thoughts again. So maybe if you could just briefly comment on what inter uh, and interact with uh, William there. Yeah, I think the contempt thing, I just don't see how you can, nothing is said about the subjective reaction, but I uh, sure think it would be different if I knew people had contempt for me, and plenty of people probably do, uh, <laughs> a lot easier to take than uh, being tormented uh, day after day forever. Uh, plus, I don't know that you can press the Daniel thing much further than than in Isaiah 14, where they're talking about the arrival in Sheol, which is a whole different thing, of the king of Babylon, where it says all the shades are aroused to greet you, and they say, you too have become as weak as we. Uh, you know, all of us, uh, everybody here, all the kings, lie, each lies in his own tomb, but you were thrown out like a sack of spoiled meat. Uh, and, uh, and, and so what that's post-mortem contempt 
you're nothing. You're a disgrace. Now, it's hard to picture anything uh, in, in continuous occurrence throughout eternity. Uh, that's kind of implied in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, because if you try to think, well, what could I be doing uh, for all eternity, um, you know, playing uh, Candy Crush or something? Uh, it's, it's just impossible. It's like just I think little... that'd be hell, by the way. Yeah, well, <laughs> I do too. I do. Um, <laughs> It's like uh, reversing John Lennon. Uh, just imagine it's not so easy if you try. Um, well, the uh, uh, thing with Judith and Daniel, though I think Daniel is very ambiguous, as I've just said, with Judith, and even if Daniel does imply a, a resurrection to contempt, whatever that is, I'm not saying that nobody ever believed there was a hell. Uh, I'm saying that in so-called intertestamental or late Old Testament times, this is where you began to see hell appear as more than the kingdom of M Molech and, uh, and so forth. So uh, the, these uh, late books may well uh, preserve a, a developing belief in, in hell. I'm just saying that even there, you got to wonder, why is it uh, that we, we don't hear about this before? Yeah, and and I'm actually looking at the term here. I'm not going to comment too much on it, but the uh, the Hebrew term is deraon, and it's um, aversion, abhorrence. So contempt might not be the best way to put it. But I'm going to continue to look into that um, while maybe Craig goes into his part. So Craig, what are, what are your thoughts on what we've heard so far? Um, we've heard a lot of opinions tonight. If we want the correct doctrine on hell, we need to understand the Orthodox Christian doctrine on hell. Um, let me just take a few historical quibbles and then I want to unpack that because it's probably not something that Dr. Price is used to interacting with and, and something I think rightfully he was skepti skeptical of when we were talking about the Twilight Zone in our last episode together. Um, I, I do think that, for example, you know, we have indications that there's hell in the Old Testament. Um, like in Job chapter 31, verses 11 to 12, Job speaks of, you know, looking upon a woman. He says, for that would be a lustful crime. Moreover, it would be iniquity punishable by judges, for it would be fire that consumes to Abaddon, and it's translated Apollyon in the Greek, in the Septuagint, and would uproot all my increase. Now, I'm aware of the apologetic that uh, Dr. Price is giving, saying, well, that doesn't mean it's eternal, but at least we're seeing, you know, the Greek translator understood it with the same Greek term for their version of torment. And we already see the conflation with this with fire. And there's other passages in the book of Job, but, you know, I would take the view there's, there's a lot of this in the Old Testament. Um, but I also think uh, we have to remember that we don't really need progressive revelation if we actually accurately understand what revelation was for the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament speaks of prophets all the time. We don't have all their writings. They probably didn't write things down. Um, their teachings were oral. So granted, um, Protestants would have an issue with this uh, epistemically, but this is not an issue within Orthodox or Catholicism where it's always been understood that the scriptures may not be explicit about something, but it's the tradition of the church, or here would be the teaching of the prophets in Judaism that people just know by oral tradition that kind of fill in those gaps. So, for example, we have a pre-90, a uh, 70 AD uh, document called the Schoolhouse Disputes that uh, speak of the arguments be uh, between the, the schools of Hillel and the schools of Shammai. And they're arguing that this, quote, a... A quick snippet of it, the school Shammai says, there are three groups, one for eternal life, one for shame and everlasting contempt, and these are those are complete, and there are those that are completely evil. An intermediate group, group go down to Gehenna and scream and come up again and are healed, as it is said, and it quotes Zechariah 13.9, and uh, I could keep going but the, the passage essentially says there's good people that go to heaven there's people that suffer from Gehenna but then leave Gehenna and then there's people that just stay in Gehenna and clearly it's somewhere of torment but the interesting thing so that this is what's going to get us to the orthodox doctrine is what the school Hillel says the school Hillel says in this document um 
Great in mercy, Exodus 34, 6, he inclines a decision towards mercy and concerning them, David said, I am happy that the Lord has heard the sound of my prayer and concerning them is said the entire passage. And uh, the Lord kills and brings light, brings down to Sheol and brings up. So the way scholars have generally interpreted this was that the, the school of Hillel thought that no, no Jews actually go to hell. So what we have to understand is that those are in Gehenna are actually just not experiencing God in the same way. So warehouses this our bridge into orthodox doctrine. Now, the issue is, if hell is something other than God, and it's bad, obviously, that makes God the creator of something evil. Now, we know from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, God makes everything and it's good. And what makes something evil is there's some privation of good. If something is inanimate, there can't be something bad about it. So with human beings, what makes something bad is that we are willing against God. So we're taking something that's a good faculty, which is free will, and then that is turned against God. And the idea is that free eternity is hell. Now, this sounds like a 20th century rationalization that is supposed to make everyone happy and sing Kumbaya. Now, I just want to very briefly make the case that, no, this has been doctrine and it's been explicit in the Fathers of Church since the second century. Um, but again, the Western paradigm speaks of grace being created versus uncreated and things to this effect. And so this gets obfuscated in Western discussions on the topic. Now, for example, just in the scriptures, and we'll start there, that the scriptures say that the damned suffer in God's presence. We see this in Revelation 14.10. We see in 2 Thessalonians 1.9 that they will suffer eternal punishment from the face of the Lord. The same things also mentioned, for example, in Acts, I forget in chapter 3 which verse, but Peter tells the people that are listening, he says, repent so that times of refreshment instead of suffering will come from the face of the Lord. Um, Isaiah 2.21 says that the damned are going to hide themselves under the rocks from the glory of his majesty. Revelation 6.16, they'll call to the mountains and rocks saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. What's going on here? From the face of God comes reward, heaven, and also comes punishment, damnation. So the reward and punishment are the same thing, but the difference are the people. It's the will of the person that twists what is the light of God into good or evil. You know, God dwells in unapproachable light. And by the way, the reference in Acts chapter 3 was verse 19. Um, so that being said, I, I, I want to get into more detail, but I just want to quickly quote St. Irenaeus so people know I'm not just speaking out of my you-know-where. And this is in Book 5 of, of Against Heresies, chapter 28, paragraph 2. Um, St. Irenaeus writes that, those therefore who cast, away, who cast away by apostasy, these forementioned things, being in fact destitute of all good, do experience every kind of punishment. God, however, does not punish them immediately of himself, but that punishment falls upon them because they are destitute of all that is good. Now, good things are eternal and without end with God, and therefore the loss of these is also eternal and never-ending. Is it is in this matter just as occurs in the case of a flood of light, those who have blinded themselves or have been blinded by others are forever deprived of the enjoyment of light. It is not, however, that the light has inflicted upon them the penalty of blindness, but it is that the blindness itself has brought calamity upon them. All right, so that's kind of a long explanation, but you know, to quote a good one liner, I'm going to just fast forward all the way to St. Mark of Ephesus. He says, eternal fire and unceasing punishment is light for those who are worthy of vision in it. You know, St. Uh, Simeon, the new theologian, says, God is fire. This flame at first purifies us from the pollution of passions, and then it becomes in us food and drink and light and joy and renders us light ourselves because we participate in his light. Um, you know, St. Uh, John the Latter says, when the holy and heavenly fire comes, to dwell in the souls of the former, as says one of those who received the title of theologian, it burns them because they still lack purification. Whereas it is the latter, according to the degree, to their perfection. For one and the same fire is called both the fire which consumes and the light which illuminates. So we have this from St. Basil. We have this from St. Isaac the Syrian. What's my point in bringing this all up? Is that this is a consistent thread with an Eastern theology for a very long time. Um, granted, St. Irenaeus is writing from France, but he also was from the Near East before he moved there. So 
I think this is implicit in the schoolhouse disputes. I think this is in the scriptures, as I made the case. I think this is in the fathers of the Orthodox Church. What is lacking is this idea that in the West, that this hell's this arbitrary punishment that God made just because you offended him and he's petty. And to me, that's a misunderstanding of what good and evil is. It's a misunderstanding of what sin is, and it's a misunderstanding of what good is. So I'll say this last morning because it ties into Dr. Price and my first conversation about the Twilight Zone episode. I sort of think you're going to get what you want when you die. And let's just pretend eternity is, a, is hanging out with God in church, and you don't like church. It's boring. Well, guess what? It's going to last a very long time. <laughs> You know, and there's going to be obviously differences. Uh, we have resurrected bodies. Um, God dwells in an approachable light. So again, without the grace to see God, that looks like it's going to have issues. We see that in transfiguration where they have to shield their eyes from God. Um, so there's other mitigating factors. But the point is, hell is the will of the eternal soul, the individual turned against God. And being that God is light, then yes, that will be scorching. That will be blinding. It will be all those things that we hear about the rocks that fall upon us and hide us from the face or the glory of the Lord. Um, so I don't know if uh, Dr. Price has interacted with this. I'd be very interested in uh, some of his thoughts about it. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Price, I want to get your thoughts on that and also just to wrap up the uh, term that we were discussing there. Um, from Daniel, maybe also get your thoughts on this as well. From what I could see, just kind of uh, during um, while while Craig was discussing that, it looks like the term that the Septuagint used to translate um, contempt there um, in the Greek is onodismos, which is used in Romans fifteen three to refer to the condemnation that Christ and the reproach that Christ took on for us in our place on the cross, and then it's also used in Hebrews 13, 13 to speak about how, um, you know, Christ bore our reproach and let us join with him going outside the camp, kind of hearkening back to the scapegoat who was sent outside of the camp and bore the reproaches of the sins of Israel. So I think that there's some connotation there to that term contempt and reproach um, that's used there in Daniel 12. Maybe if I could get your thoughts on that, maybe does that... Um, perhaps shed some light on this discussion and of course get your thoughts on what Craig was saying. Well it just seems to reinforce the apparent meaning of contempt uh, and I, I think you got to do an awful lot of stretching to make that into eternal torture mm -hmm. and uh, as such as Matthew 25 and the book of Revelation describe it seems to me to be uh, uh, it just isn't enough uh, to, to cover the uh, the 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 body there and uh, it's just like let's rewrite the passage to make it mean uh what would fit in with our theology and uh, I, the notion that all of these church fathers believed one way or the other that constitutes one wing of christianity but to me it is not uh probative of whether there is a hell. I mean, a lot of people thought the earth was flat for a long time and was making a comeback. Uh, that had no evidential uh, power as to whether or not it was. And uh, it just seems to me, uh, I, I don't really have anything more to uh, say about that. It just seems to me it's it's got very shaky supports. In It's like you're kind of looking at the various Old and New Testament passages as different drops into the same bucket, that uh, they're just bits, dribs, and drabs of the resultant doctrine of hell. And I, I just see that as an inappropriate conception of it. It's just an ancient idea, not as ancient as most biblical ideas, and there's never any explication of it. There seem to be contradictions between the rare mentions of it in the New Testament, and I, this notion that you placed yourself in hell, uh, that seems to me is still to be vicious. Like, who actually chose uh, to uh, 
exclude himself from God. They're people that don't think there's a God, so they, they don't really have the options that way. There may be people that just stopped believing in him. Should they be damned for that? It's this metaphor that you're depriving yourself of the, the uh, beatific vision. Well, if God is going to just send you down the chute like Korah and all that, there's certainly an element of, of the punished people not getting what they asked for. Uh, and uh, to me, it would make a whole lot more sense if God just took the scales off of their eyes. Why not uh, convert them by grace uh, when when they die? And so the the, uh, the blindfold will be taken off. And they say, gee, I wish I'd have uh, realized this sooner. Why? What is, how is there any purpose or reason to having them uh, subjected to eternal torment. Mm -hmm. Once somebody asked uh, Clarence Darrow, what if you're wrong and when you die, you uh, wind up with a big circle of the apostles and the prophets in front of you and uh, they'll say, well, uh, Darrow, what do you got to say for yourself now? And he said, well, I'll just say, gentlemen, I was mistaken. Like, is that something that ought to lead, that ought to uh, put somebody in hell? Was it so nefarious uh, that uh, they get what Hitler probably didn't even deserve, though he's the most wicked man that ever lived? Um, I, I just find it uh, an attempt to ameliorate a monstrous notion with uh, ad hoc hypotheses. I mean, I could be wrong, obviously, like Darrow. But I just, I could not sincerely say, okay, I believe there is a hell and that it's good that it happens that way. I, I just recoil from that. You know, Dr. Um, Price, I would agree with you that, you know, Daniel is not actually referring to something that would be not necessarily excluding it, but I don't think he's really getting at uh, this is, you know, demonstration that one is going to have an eternal conscious torment uh, if they have this reproach. Um, I think that we would get that from other passages, especially in the New Testament. Uh, so just wanted to clarify that I agree with you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily use that as a proof text to show that there's any kind of torment. Um, Can I jump I, in for 30 seconds real quick? Yeah, yeah. and after that, okay. Eric is going to be next. Definitely, yeah. That, that, I'm going to be really quick because I, I really want to hear Eric. Uh, mm -hmm. He has great insight all the time. Uh, Robert, just to really toss this at you, because I know we opened up the show um, focusing on the Old Testament. So, you know, kind of before we move into the New Testament or talk about anything else, can you maybe briefly touch upon Judith, where I do truly believe we are, we do read about conscious, eternal torment and pain because we read, and we're talking, we're reading about Judgment Day, and we read, the Lord Almighty will take vengeance on them in the Day of Judgment. He will send fire and worms into their flesh, and they will weep in pain forever. I mean, if you could just give me your thoughts there, would you be willing to concede that perhaps the book of Judith, maybe you're not willing to, to concede Daniel, but would you be willing to concede perhaps the book of Judith uh, does have this concept of eternal torment, eternal hell there being taught? Oh, it might well, sure does sound like that, but then this is a late book. I'm not suggesting nobody in the biblical continuum ever believed in it. I'm just saying it uh, it only shows up very late, which seems suspicious to me. Like, why didn't but, I... But it is the Old Testament. Huh? But, but the only reason I brought it up, I do agree with you, it would be later than Daniel and Genesis, but it is part of the Old Testament. Well, um, I don't see what difference that makes. It's uh, it, to me, it doesn't really matter if it's new but not Old Testament. There, there are late books that uh, seem to uh, reflect later teachings uh, from the Hellenistic sure. world, from oh, yeah. the Persian Empire, and all that. Uh, what's the reference in Judith? Judith chapter sixteen, verse seventeen. Yeah, let's see here. Well, the Lord then, Almighty will take vengeance on them. He's talking about a judgment day, and then we read about um, uh, he's going to send fire and the worms into their flesh, and they're going to weep in pain forever. To me, I think we have a clear vision of them being aware of what is going on and eternal torment, eternal pain that is being, uh, you know, being undertaken there. 
Well, on the other hand, this is ta- seems to be talking about the judgment of Israel's national enemies, uh, not the end of, not a moral judgment on individuals. Uh, it doesn't envision that uh, people that there are. Uh, it doesn't talk about uh, one by one, like in the book of Proverbs, for instance. They don't really care what nation you belong to. It's not verse, Jew versus Gentile. It's wise versus fool. And uh, here, however, it's this nationalistic thing. Uh, those people, those peoples, those nations uh, are going to get it. And the uh, the maggots eating you alive, that's what they thought happened to Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, he didn't go to hell necessarily. Uh, the um, In Isaiah 66, where it says, the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched. Are there worms with eternal life? Did the uh, the uh, just constant supply of them, or does it envision just um, um, again a kind of a a, def- a worldly defeat? Uh, I don't know. It's not absolutely clear, and it might uh, be individual eschatology, but it doesn't seem like it to me. It seems to be saying these nations are going to catch hell uh, because they've dared to uh, oppose the people of God. You don't think maybe perhaps Judgment Day there would be talking about maybe the um, the end of their lives? Uh, I doubt it. If it, if it's judgment coming upon whole nations. Like you you have something like the distinction you're proposing in Matthew 25, where it it says the nations will be assembled before the Son of Man on the left and on the right. And uh, and then he'll say to those on the left, you know, hell on the right, the heavens prepared for you. And they're both surprised to say, what, what, uh, when did we see you in uh, needing this help and didn't give it to you? Uh, well, it seems to me the context for that is the mission charge in Matthew and the other synoptics, where uh, he's talking about his brethren being the itinerant missionaries. And uh, don't worry, your needs will be taken care of. God will see to it that you're fed and all that. Uh, and those who uh, do receive you, God's peace will rest on them. Those who don't uh, shake the dust from your feet and uh, tell them, look, the kingdom of God has come near. You, you don't say you weren't warned. And that seems to imply in these various cities, some will repent and some will not. Uh, but I don't see a distinction like that in view in a nationalistic kind of an Old Testament book like Judith. It's the, these nations are damned because they're the enemies of Israel. And I think that's a whole, and I'm not even sure if they're talking about post-mortem damnation. Uh, a lot of this stuff seems to be the day of judgment will be the day when uh, Assyria or Babylon or whatever are stricken down finally. It just seems anachronistic to me to say they're talking about whether or not you had a personal relationship with Jehovah. Okay, um, Eric, hey, do you mind uh, weighing in here? I want to get your thoughts as well. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to pick up back on uh, Mark, uh, the gospel according to Mark chapter 9. And I think uh, Dr. Price uh, made a reference there earlier where uh, Jesus Christ says, if your hand causes you to sin cut it off, it is better for you to enter into life means rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. And he says, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So the, Dr. Price, just so I can confirm this, you would agree that Jesus Christ is teaching everlasting torment here. Uh, very likely. Yeah. It's not quite as explicit well, even though this one's not completely explicit either in Matthew 25, depart for the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That does seem to me most naturally to mean that you're in for it for the extremely long haul. Though there are other passages that seem to see it as a debtor's prison, that you won't get out of there until you've paid the last farthing, which is the usual view of hell in Hinduism and Buddhism. You, you can calculate the worth of your sins and and eventually you can uh, 
pay for them by being taken out of your hide. So once again, I don't know that any of this goes back to a historical Jesus. There's, I, there's no way to know anymore, but I do think the passages probably do intend uh, conscious torment forever those. Yeah, yeah, I would agree because the logic is it's better to enter into life having lost something than to enter into hell where you gain all this unending suffering. If it was just annihilation or a, a, a just a, you know a really long time, uh, it wouldn't seem to make sense. But then you also made reference to Isaiah 66, which is where Jesus is getting the reference from. And in that passage, you know, it says, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. So the logic of this passage in, in my reading, you know, if we want to read it just with naked, nude literalism, we're talking about human carcasses with a fire that doesn't ever get put out and a worm or worms that don't die, worms that continually feed upon the corpse. Um, fires are quenched by, by consuming what they're burning. You know, so the idea here is that the body itself is being preserved. And I would think that it's the more preferable interpretation of Isaiah here to exclude the idea that all that is being intended here is a physical body being sort of like lit up forever. It would seem as though this is referring to uh, an intended penalty or a punishment that, that is exhibited by the everlasting character of the, of the fire. Well, on the other hand, it only speaks about the carcasses and right. uh, what happens to the carcasses, the fire and the maggots. And uh, it uh, makes me think that maybe we're not dealing with uh, anything post-mortem for any conscious soul or anything that people will pass by and say, well, you get a look at the, that. They, they sure deserve what they got. And that sounds like uh, that uh, it's another version of the Daniel thing, that they will rise to the contempt of those who pass by. And uh, the is the... Uh, eternal thing uh, is, is that I mean that's the thing I would suspect is figurative here given all this the physical body references though of course I, I don't know I mean it just yeah. more yeah, no, it's it's totally it's totally within the field goal of uh, rational interpretation to take it that way but in my what I'm drawing is on the preferability of, of seeing it in terms of a, an everlasting conscious punishment because it doesn't seem to be it doesn't seem to be with purpose for a carcass to be continually on fire do you see what i mean um it seems as though the body itself is being preserved and that would have a purpose as well and not just to be a spectacle of a burning body but that the body itself is receiving the pain of the fire. But uh, this reminds me of something I heard in a Calvinist church that uh, this guy said that, that when there's the resurrection of the wicked, a la the book of Revelation, God is going to give them resurrection bodies, but made of asbestos and with loads of nerve endings. Uh, so they're engineered to be uh, driven out of their minds by uh, pain such as no one has, has imagined. Uh, and that, that seems even if God has flicked that on somebody, it, it seems fiendish to me. But again, it doesn't speak about the subjectivity of the carcasses. It says that they will be a shame and a reproach in the eyes of those who see them, much like the way the Romans left bodies on the crosses as long as they could. So people will say, oh, geez, take a look at this. This guy thought he was the man who was king. Uh, and this is a warning. Hey, Jews, 
you see what happened to this guy, don't do the same thing. Yeah. That, that I get the impression that, yeah, there's the contempt again uh, of the dead body. If you were going to talk about post-mortem conscious suffering, this is an odd way to put it. Yeah, well, you know, the, like I said, it, just from the Isaiah passage itself, it's definitely within the field goal of a rational reading. But you would admit, though, that a, an early Hebrew interpretation of an early in in, uh, in in the teaching of Jesus, anyway, takes it to be uh, conscious suffering under yeah. an everlasting fire. Okay. The other thing I wanted to uh, bring out uh, from Daniel 12 is uh, the passage I have it here. I'm, I'm reading the New King James Version, uh, it, where uh, Daniel writes, and many of those who sleep, so he's talking about a category of persons who are sleep are sleeping. We know we know what that means in the biblical usage. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So there's a transition in the in the category of persons here from sleep to awake. Mm -hmm. Now, we were talking before about unconscious carcasses lit up on fire for all eternity to have contempt in the eyes of those who see them. Mm -hmm. I think Daniel's here is telling us something else. Let's move on. He says, and, and many of those who sleep in the dust shall of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, if it was simply a reproach, to be in the eyes of the people beholding, let's say, the corpse or the carcasses, you know, the dead bodies, there would be no reason to speak about a transition from sleeping to being awake for those who awake unto everlasting shame. So it would seem as though the prior transition from sleep to being alive again in order to enter into reproach of uh, the uh, all the other uh, uh, most of the in the in the English of the King James or the New King James the Hebrew word here is translated not shame but reproach and so it would seem as though the persons who are transiting from being asleep to awake in order to gain the reproach themselves bingo I see what you mean yeah and, and not just not just the reproach that onlookers would have, but but a reproach that they bear. You know, in, in the Old Testament, uh, there's many there's many instances where somebody who who bore reproach is asking the Lord, uh, Lord, take away the reproach that I bear. So, in other words, um, it would seem unfitting for there to be an everlasting reproach if we're talking about beings that don't exist anymore, you know, um, shame that they're dead. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, it seems as though again, and like you, like, you know, a lot of these passages have a variety of rational, reasonable interpretations. But um, I want to make clear. I agree with you that if, if you're saying they awaken unto this, you know, how are they doing that? If they remain oblivious, yeah, yeah. So it would seem as though the the kind of reproach is being enveloped in the kind that a person experiences mm -hmm. themselves, and if that's everlasting, then it would seem as though this is talking about a post mortem <clears throat> everlasting uh, reproach or shame. You know, I don't know if if, if that's something you could see there. Well. Uh it makes a bit more sense if we imagine uh, that they, like uh, FDR said, it's a day that will live in infamy. Well, these people will now be uh, known forever, like Hitler or Charlie Manson. Uh, and uh, that uh, apparently at some point, uh, Jews in the Old Testament thought, that immortality, quote unquote, was having a good name, a good reputation that would follow you after your death. That seems to make more sense to me. But I, I have to say, as you say, why speak of them as awakening then? So yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I uh, totally understand what you mean there. That's definitely there in a lot of the, the ancient literature, and, and you even get that in Greek literature, where uh, a person's name, you know, will they remember your name, uh, is, is kind of synonymous with an eternal life, because your life is diffused in the memory of all these people. But in this case, since the parallel is you know, you've got this category of persons who all of them are sleeping in the dust. And then a, a transition comes about from them sleeping in the dust to being awake. And then they, I, I'm agreeing. Yeah, I think you yeah. made a good point. And, and, then, and then there's a separation between the two after they become awake, one to eternal life, and then one to eternal contempt. So it, if we were going to take the view which sees eternal life as like um, this, you know, memorabilia type, uh, honorific uh, memory of a person in the lives of the successors, that wouldn't seem to comport with the eternal life that's being talked about here because that transition from sleeping in the dust and the sleeping in the dust is not like their name was forgotten and, and all of a sudden it got remembered. It's talking about an organic or an ontological coming to life. And, and so I would say that it's reasonable to, to see the same for the, for the second transition for, and not for the second. Oh, transition, yes. for the I agree. Second. I'm, I'm still only saying that the contempt thing doesn't make clear what we would really need to be clear to invoke this as uh, uh, fuel for the fire for belief in an eternal hell of torment. Yeah. It might have yeah, it's just, but I, I agree with you. You made a real good point about the, yeah, this seems to be post-mortem something or other. Yeah. And the, you know, the, 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 the comments you made about the justice of uh, the eternality of hell, uh, you know, it's a question that, the, the Christian literature since the beginning doesn't seem to quite uh, uh, satisfactorily handle, you know, and a lot of us Christians realize that, you know, when you're a Christian for a long enough, you realize that part of becoming a Christian is not so that you can get all of your questions answered, but in many ways to be happy and okay with not having your questions answered. And the fact that there are many more unanswered questions than there are answerable questions. And any atheist would have to say the same, the same thing. thing. Exactly. Right. So I would pay the courtesy. Unknowns. Yeah, yeah. So I would pay the same Better courtesy. Used to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I think we would owe each other the same courtesy on that level. But, um, you know, the whole notion of, you know, a God who's just growing and simmering and irritation. And, and that, you know, the idea to have sinners in his sight is, you know, repulsive to him. And, and so hell is predicated off of this idea where God is like, you know, he's irritated with sinners and he just, he just has to pay off his justice by damning them forever. That's actually not a position in the, in the Catholic Church. Um, we take the position that was outlined, I think, the best in St. Thomas Aquinas, which he took the position that all sin is a certain kind of disorder. So there's a prior existing order, and then sin introduces a disorder into that order. Now, not all sins are deserving of eternal hell. That's another difference that we may have with, I, I remember when I was a Protestant, um, I did not. I did not. Under, I did not buy into the idea that there are different sins with a different proportion of, to their punishments. Um, but in the Catholic world, uh, there are venial and mortal sins. You, you, I'm sure you're familiar with that distinction. Oh, I got to tell you something here. Go ahead. Back in a Baptist high school age Sunday school class, is uh, uh, the um, they're talking about beliefs of Catholics. And the Sunday school teacher said, anybody know the two categories of sin according to Catholicism? And this one 
guy said, uh, yeah, mortal and venereal. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he's a very intelligent guy, but he did sort of sound like a dummy. But I thought that was a great uh, goof. Sorry, go ahead. Man. No, 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 that's funny, man. Anytime you can add something like that, please do. Um, but, you know, the distinction between moral and venial is basically uh, more or less between deadly and versus undeadly sin. You know, mortal sin is a, a sin which brings you to the to the you know to the mortal to the to the mm -hmm. to the place of the dead. Um, the the kind of disorder or the kind of sin which causes a disorder which effects an everlasting punishment is the kind of disorder which turns completely away from God, who alone is the immutable good. There's only one immutable good, unchangeable good, everlasting good, and that is God. When you unplug a when you unplug a wire from an outlet, it no longer has any connection to the source of electrical power. That electrical power is now alien to that plug or to whatever is connected to that plug, like a lamp or whatever. So in the same way, Mortal sins, deadly sins, is a, 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 a turning away of the soul from the only immutable and everlasting good. So the effect would naturally be, it would naturally be to the mutable evil or the mutable good, which is changeable and um, it decays and it's going to, you know, it's going to rot over time. So that's more of a, that's not, that, that kind of transition there is not where God grows in this intolerance of you and, and, and kind of just, you know, turns your shoulders around and pushes you away. It's more of your soul has become disordered now. So your will, your intellect, is no longer compatible or subject to the life of God. And so it puts no delight in God for that to happen. Why doesn't he just heal them? It sounds like they've gone insane in a sense. <laughs> yes, yeah, it, that's, that's why we, it's important to have a distinction between the mortal and venial sin, because mortal sin is the kind of sin where the person, the subject, does kind of go insane and they're culpable for it. So there's, you know, it has to be a serious issue, uh, a serious moral matter. Uh, it has to be done with full knowledge. So you fully know what you're doing. And number three, you have to give full consent of the will. So your will can be, you have ample time ample information to say, this is not right, I shouldn't do this, but you're going to do it anyway, and you're going to go with it all the way. So it is a kind of insanity. It, it is. Um, and, but the issue is, and this is where the Christians get into, uh, you, you know, the, 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 I guess the burden goes on them again, is why is it done all the time and so easily? You know, wh why, is it, why is it so common and why is it in every person? Right? Because the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, it, would, it would be more appropriate if there was, you know, really wicked category of human beings like that. But in the biblical schema, there's, it's all. It, it's, it's all. Um, anyway, I just wanted to give you the, the understanding of that whole issue of disorder and order and how the two organically can't go together. So it's, it's not so much about God being delighted in the death of the wicked. Um, it's, 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 much, it's far more, the, if, God, if the scripture speaks about delight that God has, it's not so much in the death of the wicked, it's delight in the fact that justice has been accomplished, which is a different end. It's a different, there's a different cause and effect. So anyway, I don't want to take up the whole thing here, but I just wanted to add that in there because it, 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 
it, it really does. I know I came from a, a Baptist background. I was re- I was raised Catholic, but I, I definitely went into the Reformed Baptist world, and uh, I sat under all kinds of holiness preachers that had a hundred and one analogies for why God, um, you know, took pleasure or or somehow required your punishment. And it would seem as though the onus was all on God, as if this was God's problem, you know. Anyway, so I'll, 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 I'll give it back to... Uh, uh, did you ever hear Al Martin? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's the... He's the I remember they used, to, they used to have a towel up at the pulpit because he, every time he used to sweat, I think there was people he used to bring the uh, refill the jug of water on his, on his uh, podium. Yeah, I heard him preach a few times back in the mid '70s, and uh, it was something to see. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. he'd flip right over from predestination to uh, repent. It's up to you, uh, and all that. What? Uh, it's one of those antinomies. But he was quite a speaker. Really amazing. Yeah, there's 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 a lot of power of influence that that a preacher can have, and. Uh, it, there, there's a lot. There's a lot to the art of preaching, and uh, you got to be real careful because it, it could consume you. Um, Dr. Price, I want to get to some chat questions, but one, one last thing that I wanted to touch on that y'all both were addressing is y'all were talking about Isaiah 66 and the fire that's mentioned there. Um, it's interesting that the abhorrence term that's in uh, Isaiah 66 is the same term. There are mm-hmm. in Daniel 12, where there's eternal contempt or eternal abhorrence. And Jesus then also confirms this same hell in Isaiah 66, as y'all noted, is eternal. So there does seem to be a connection between what's taking place between um, Isaiah 66 and Daniel 12. So we, we see imagery here of fire. So there's some kind of torment going on here. You see an aspect of it being eternal in Daniel 12, and then Jesus comes and confirms that uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, I believe. And so I, I just thought I would throw that out there, get your thoughts on that uh, to wrap it up, and then we're going to go to some chat questions. Uh, that puts me in mind again of the, the business about what Gehenna was thought to mean for a long time. The guy that that uh, floated the garbage dump theory, which sounds very plausible, was Joseph Kimchi, I think. I believe he was in the 12th century. And uh, it, it doesn't prove anything, but it's kind of interesting that he took these passages to mean that uh, sinners were uh, just thrown in there to rot, to be devoured, and to eventually be burned up. And instead of getting uh, a holy funeral, and uh, that he didn't, he certainly, obviously, couldn't have thought these actual bodies uh, at the foot of uh, Mount Zion would be there forever. But uh, the fact that you were uh, tossed in there uh, might uh, imply that he thought uh, the everlasting was the everlasting reproach. People would say, oh, yeah, Price, uh, he's just uh, uh, burning away in there because he was such a scoundrel that mm-hmm. uh, they couldn't give him a decent burial. And uh, and every time you pass by, you, you think of some notorious sinner and say, well, there you go. That's what happens. And uh, that could be, at least that implies uh, uh, some Jewish, uh, some rap rabbinical scholar who probably understood it that way. But again, who knows? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, for now, let me uh, get to this question. Then I want to get some concluding thoughts from everybody. And then we're going to come back to you to wrap it all up. Uh, the question is from Luca. Brief question. Why is the fact many people believed the flat earth relevant in the context of the church fathers when they profess it's round and not flat? I guess what he is basically saying is, why was it relevant when you noted, well, you know, some of the church fathers, Fathers or some early figures believed in a flat earth. Therefore, the you know church fathers aren't very authoritative because you know people believed all kinds of things. Oh, all I meant to say was you can have people mistaken for hundreds and hundreds of years. You can't settle truth by a majority vote. Everybody was pretty sure it was true, but it wasn't. And the thing, the same thing might be true about this. That yeah, a whole line of uh, church fathers and theologians, profound and intelligent in many ways, all believed in hell. That doesn't make them right. They probably believed in a bunch of things uh, that uh, that 
have been disproven since. That, that's the only analogy I meant to, to suggest. Um, this next one is for William. Uh, does the book of Judith speak of the earthly or the afterlife when it speaks of judgment? I think in the context, it's uh, earthly, since it's the nations who persecute or conquer Israel that are going to get it. And uh, I, I, it seems to me that has to be what the what the ancients would have understood. And uh, if, if they were... Uh, defeated uh, they they might well be burnt up their their weapons their tanks their their corpses it doesn't necessarily have a literal afterlife view but again uh, it's mm -hmm. certainly up for grabs and it's late enough that even mm -hmm. in the scenario that i envision they they may well have adapted the, uh, mm -hmm. the idea of an eternal hell of fire william your thoughts on that yeah, I do. I really do think it is talking about the afterlife. I think that if you look at what verse 12 uh, puts forth, verse 12 talks about um, people dying, perishing before the army of the Lord. You already have, um, you already had the stage set for these, the, the army, these individuals that were opposing the, 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 the Lord, they're dead. And then you hop on over to verse 17. First off, you read a uh, uh, praises that are being sung to the Lord and a few other things and you hop under verse 17 and you have that um, the rebuke we're told woe to the nations that rise up against my people but a little bit before that we had read that uh, these individuals were murdered they're dead already and then we read that God will take vengeance on them on the day of judgment I think even if you want to take uh, even if you want to say that the day of judgment was that judgment that was uh, the punishment of them perishing even if you take that kind of uh, ideology i think the fact that verse 12 already shows us that they're dead already a punishment is sent upon them that is fire and worms into their flesh and eternal pain forever so they're dead and they're going to be punished in an eternal manner i really do think i think and, and i don't think this is my opinion only i've read uh, the commentary of the earliest writers and read the reference and the comment of this verse and they uh, they say things along the same lines i i really do think that that um it is talking about the afterlife. Yeah. Now that pretty much does it for our chat questions. What I want to do now is get briefly, you know, two to three minute concluding thoughts from William, then Craig, then Eric, and then Dr. Price. You're going to wrap it up for us. Give it your overall impression of everything uh, and your concluding thoughts. So William, take two, two, three minutes there to give us your, your final thoughts. Oh yeah. I, I, again, I greatly appreciate having um, Robert on the show. Robert is an incredible scholar, a great debater, great theologian. I really, really just loved having you on. I've had a blast. And we do have our differences, of course. There, there are things that we do where we disagree, things where we clearly do not um, agree in the same manner. I think we, we, we look at what we've been talking about today. We look at the fact that we've been covering um, uh, Daniel chapter uh, 12, we look at, um, we, we didn't have a lot of time to go into Isaiah, Matthew, or many other passages. But I think that the teaching of eternal punishment, this teaching of hell, eternal torment in the afterlife, I truly do believe that that is, is taught as early as the Old Testament. I believe that this has been a teaching of the church from the very beginning. I don't think this just popped up um, in the Old Testament era. I really, truly do believe that this is a, a not only ancient, ancient biblical, historical, um, I think the one thing to me that does stick out the most, and you know, maybe later on in the show, we can actually do a show on the church fathers with Robert. It would be, that would be incredible, um, but that would be a topic for a whole, other day, a whole other day. I think the church fathers serve as a great witness. And I remember uh, a few years back, I remember uh, debating a gentleman by the name of Chris Date. He perpetuates uh, uh, the argument of uh, annihilationism. He's one of the proponents of that movement. And Sorry, what's I the remember, name again? Uh, Chris Date. I don't know, man. Okay, thanks. Yeah, he, he's, he's very popular in, in the sense that I think he's one of the ones that is really, really um, pushing that movement. And I remember when I debated him, he got quite upset that during the cross-examination, I used a massive majority of my time using the church fathers. He didn't like that at all. Why do I bring that up? I bring that up because I think the church fathers served as a very important witness to show that this was a teaching firmly entrenched in the church from the very beginning. Remember Craig earlier made a comment that 
you can find this as early as the apostolic era. I, I agree with him. And I think the fact that we can find this as early as the apostolic era, I think that lends credence to the fact that this comes from the biblical era. We can find it as early as the New Testament and the Old Testament. I really do think that this has always been a teaching um, within the Judaism, Christianity. The one area where I will, I will agree with you, Robert, I will agree with you wholeheartedly before I, I, I close here, is it is a very, very tough doctrine, a tough teaching to accept within the faith. I have been told by many people that they have left Catholicism or Protestantism, evangelicalism as well, because of the teaching of hell. I agree it is a hard teaching, but I think there are a lot of teachings within the faith that are hard. I don't think merely because it is hard that that would disqualify it as being a truthful teaching. Uh, I don't have a whole lot more to say other than saying, Robert, I greatly appreciate dialoguing with you again, my Mm. friend. um, I love you greatly as a friend, and I look forward to dialoguing with you more in the future. You bet. Craig, uh, your final thoughts. I'll just shotgun them real fast. Uh, uh, Dr. Price said, why doesn't God just convert him to grace, take the scale off their eyes? You know, it reminds me of the the rich man in Lazarus. And he's like, oh, well, why don't you send someone to tell my brothers that no? And they said, well, if they don't believe the the prophets, they're not going to believe if someone raises from the dead. So the Orthodox teaching would be people can't just convert. It's not like a light switch. They do have a, a sincere freedom of will, which is why they're in the image of God. It's, uh, you know, probably sounds like an escape hatch, but like I said, I think that's implicit in that parable, the rich man and Lazarus. Um, I'd be really interested in what Dr. Price thinks of Acts 3.18, you know, because you know, 319, because the passage says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the face of the Lord. Mm-hmm. So we went ad nauseum into all these passages that say punishment comes from the face of the Lord. So I don't think this is picking, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there and picking what you like. I think this is a consistent thread in the scripture. It'd be hard to say otherwise. Um, also, you know, Responding to Dr. Price, he says, well, you know, there's not enough people telling enough and it's kind of, you know, spread out in all different schools among the church fathers over time. And I'll just say, you know, St. Irenaeus knew Papias, um, knew rather uh, Polycarp who knew Papias, who knew the apostles. So yes, it's like a game of telephone, three people removed, but it shows he's early enough where he's the first person really going to detail about what hell is. And he gives this orthodox interpretation, not these pits of fires and people sticking pitchforks up here. You know, where, you know, he gives the more, you know, 20th century rational view of hell, but no, that's the earliest elaborated view of hell. And I think that's sometimes not appreciated um, in those discussion, in this discussion. Um, Lastly, I, I just like to, I like his his opinion on what's he think about the the orthodox doctrine has he heard it before and would he say well i admit this sounds like at least this has been consistently articulated by the orthodox communion from what he could tell all right and um eric your final thoughts and then dr price you're gonna uh come and you know summarize everything for us yeah um you know like like we were talking before i think uh, the three passages there, which I think Michael wrapped up after uh, Dr. Price and I spoke, really do uh, give the best demonstration that, uh, aside from the Judith quote that uh, William gave, which I thought was just as clear, if not clear, um, that the you know the transition from being asleep to being awake in order to enter into everlasting contempt or everlasting reproach. Um, and then that being under uh, that being parallel in Isaiah 66 with the unquenchable fire and the uh, worm that does not die. And then obviously, I know we're going through centuries forward here, but Jesus Christ takes that to mean uh, eternal suffering. I think that the teaching is pretty clear from from the Old Testament writ and the New Testament writ. And obviously the early Christians who were followers of Jesus would have had the same understanding. Um, 
the other issue really is, okay, fine, that's true, but it's, it's just such an intolerable doctrine. I mean, it's, it's one of those doctrines that um, if one was to be honest, you know, and I think uh, Dr. Price mentioned this, that even if he was to, even if we were to be given a ticket out of this, he'd, he'd give it back because there's some sort of moral degeneracy. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, that's not the right word. There's some sort of moral disorder that one has to gain in order to embrace this view. And, and the cost of having that violation of conscience might even be more than, than, than the cost of being able to get out of hell with a free ticket. So I think Dr. Price is coming from a very, a, a much more intellectual point of view on this than just simply what does the, the, the scripture teach. And, you know, we haven't been able to satisfy that question here in this show. It, it just, I don't know if we've ever satisfied that as Christians altogether. But what I did mention, I think, does provide a better way of understanding that issue of sin and exclusion and exile from the good or from God. And then also what Craig was mentioning is the freedom, freedom of the will, Um Speaking of cost, it's more costly to to get rid of freedom than it is to uh, keep it and have that real risk of cutting oneself off from God and keeping that disorder for all uh, for the rest of time and for eternity. So the the cost of getting rid of our freedom it, it, that's that that's way out that that's way above the cost of uh, understanding that, hey, we do have the risk of falling into this uh, terrible fate. And uh, the other thing I would say is that there is a level of humility that must be born in this doctrine. Uh, there's many Christians who give it, give it a terrible witness. Uh, I'll admit that. I've seen it. Uh, I've it was being who had given it, and I'm in, and uh, I pray God that I I give it a good witness now. But a lot of humility has to be born because it is one of those doctrines that kind of just our jaws drop and we don't know how to really pick it up and, and walk away normal. If, if we're going to take this view, it changes us inside unless we're humble enough to realize that hey, we can't answer every single question in this world. We are just mere men. And um, there's always, you know, there's, there's always uh, the, the wager, you know, is it going to be more worth my clutching to the incongruous nature of this doctrine um, or, would it, or would it benefit me more if, if in the case it is true um, to, take, to take that wager? I know that's a low-level thinking process and we could talk about others, but... That is a, something that really helped me in my process out of atheism. I was an atheist. I, I remember my, my grandparents were taking me to mass, and I'd bring science books and all whatever, philosophy books to read. I wouldn't stand. I wouldn't pray. And I was such an ardent atheist, and I, I was just so closed in and all the same kind of thoughts we're talking about here. I just thought that there was just absolutely no reason to believe in God, and especially the Christian God, um, especially as it has been lived out in history. There's so much there to pick at. Um, so I pray that there's some humility born, which I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is tons already. So. Uh, Dr. Price, your uh, comments on all of this and concluding thoughts. Well, I guess the main thing I want to say is the idea of uh, uh, this heliotropism that as the plant moves toward the sun to gain nourishment and life, uh, that is what's going on in worship. Uh, that, I, I think, is a, a real good analogy explaining the value of worship, though I uh, have to admit I'm not sure that's mentioned in the Bible where it just says you owe your creator this praise because of his excellence. But the idea of the, the heliotropism 
uh, that does seem to me to apply to worship, but I don't see how that fits with an eternity of torment in hell. Uh, and it does seem to me to psychologize it, to say that uh, somebody who never wanted God is suddenly going to miss him and say, oh boy, if only I could partake of the heavenly vision. Well, if, if that's what they're feeling, sinner's remorse, why doesn't God simply uh, take away the mental or spiritual disorder? Why doesn't he just heal him as, he, as Jesus cast out the demons? Seems to me if you're going to compel somebody uh, in a major thing after death, that's the thing to compel them to. Just snap them out of it. Like Paul, and he uh, doesn't sit there and deliberate. Hmm, could I have been wrong about this? What would C.S. Lewis say? Now, he, he just got uh, converted by this uh, this uh, attack from Jesus, to put it a little uh, grossly. Uh, and it's like Pentheus being hypnotized by Dionysus in the Bacchae. He doesn't have any choice in it. Bang, you're converted. Uh, and uh, it, it seems to me, why doesn't he just do that with, uh, uh, with everybody when, when they uh, die and wake up? Wesley said there's nothing... Uh, sanctifying about the headsman's acts. And he's talking about uh, purgatory and Christian perfection. Well, I say maybe there is. Uh, maybe if there is a, uh, uh, a God and uh, the sinners are those who didn't see the point of worshiping him before, if now they're regretting it, it implies they kind of do see the point now, why not give them a break and say, well, why don't you come home as the, the prodigal? I know you wouldn't have done it on your own, but good to have you back. Okay. Well, uh, Dr. Price, um, I thank you so much for coming on. I want to have you on again. I think William was just telling us he, he had to jet, but he uh, would love to be able to ask you to come on again, maybe to discuss the church fathers. So I think he'll be getting in touch with you about that uh, Great. Yeah, shortly. It's always mighty it was, enjoyable. Yeah, it was definitely an honor having you. Go ahead and put a plug for your material. Anything that you want to uh, just you know plug as far as website or contact information or books coming out? Yeah, I have this website, robertmprice.mindvendor.com, that has an archive of my sermons, uh, stories, articles, and so on. Not complete, but more than enough to bore you into a coma. And uh, my, uh, my column, Zarathustra Speaks, and uh, I guess there are clicks on uh, books of mine that you can order off of Amazon and, and so on. So I got uh, my name on a lot of dubious things there. <laughs> Excellent. Again, it was a pleasure having you, and I'd love to have you on again. So we'll be in touch off the air. But, okay. Uh, again, thank you for coming on. Eric, Craig, thank you both also for showing up and uh, giving, a, giving, your, giving your input. Always an honor to have you too as well. Thank you so much for having me. It's even greater honor to have Mike. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, everybody, please comment, like, subscribe. Also go to the Reason and Theology um, dot com website and there is a donation page on there if you want to donate and help support what we're doing here to maybe get some better uh computer material to get uh better better shows quality shows in the future uh but again everybody please share this information on your social media and thank you for watching god bless you all and go share your faith <laughs>